Jake was supposed to be here to introduce me, but apparently I need no introduction. <laughs> so, thank you for coming. Uh, some of you are here of your own volition. Uh, last night I won big at roulette. I was trying to get rid of all my money so I could go, go to sleep, and then I put 500 on one number and hit it, so I had 17,000. And I went around handing out thousands, telling people they had to come. I know at least one person showed up. Uh, anybody who's with them, that person took fake money to be here. They are a cheap date. Uh, if you took my money and you're not here, I will track you down. So I'm, I, I want to thank Jake for uh, inviting me to, uh, to, to come here. It's been, I have spoken at aquarium meetings before, uh, but it's been a while. I am uh, I'm not an aquarium person myself, but I hope, hopefully there's some of what I say will be of interest. Um, you know, when Jake invited me, I had to think, oh, what am I going to talk about? Because I don't like to just do the same talk I've done before, a very general thing. So I had to give him a title, which was Function of Fluorescence on the Reef. But then as I thought about it, I realized that that, that was too narrow and scientific, perhaps. So it also made me think more about what I'm doing and what you're doing. And, and a common thread, I realize, is just, you know, why, why do you have these aquariums? It's because they look good. Sanjay was talking this morning about his lighting. And it was all about, the, you know, it's all a visual thing. You know, and he, he felt lost when his corals died. And he didn't have that to look at, and, you know, the way he lights it up. And all of you really, you know, with all the money you spend on equipment and you worry about phosphates, you know, you don't care about phosphates. You care about how your aquarium looks. And to me, I realized that, but at the same time, you're into technology. You have to be into technology in order to make your thing work. And in a way, you're into science, because it's the combination of the science Sorry, Jake, I went ahead. And, uh, uh, you know, you have to be into the science because the science is also what teaches about, you know, the, the chemistry and the temperature and all the sort of thing. So it's a combination of, of, the, of the technology, the science, and the visual aspect. And I realized that that's exactly what has motivated me. You know, as I've been captivated by the beauty of fluorescence, uh, that's involved solving technology problems to uh, to see it and to photograph it, and it's also gotten me involved in, this, in the science of it. So I realized that there was a, while I'm not an aquarium person, we have some uh, very similar motivations. So I was, I started, you, you may not realize, a lot of you may not realize this, uh, if you've come to this thing and you go downstairs and there's blue lights and fluorescence everywhere, that a number of years ago, there really was not an awareness that corals fluoresce. It just really wasn't well known. There were some anecdotal things going back to the late 50s and the 60s, but it never caught on. And there was no scientific, there was virtually no scientific literature on it. And uh, people were not doing fluorescence diving. And there was just not something that was out there. So I developed equipment in, uh, originally in Massachusetts. Uh, there was not a healthy coral community in Massachusetts. And once I, once I got the gear working, I went down to Honduras, to the reef. And immediately, this is going now back to uh, about 1985. You know, here's a couple corals in white light. And the same corals fluorescing. And I could take you right to those two corals if you want to pay my way to Honduras. And, uh, you know, and it's just that was it. I knew that all the, you know, all the, all the work I had put in to get this gear working and, and to make this happen paid off at that moment. And that was it. I was just hooked. Things like this, a coral on the side of a shipwreck, white light. It's a small coral, a couple inches diameter. Same thing fluorescing. How can you not love that? So what's going on? So what is, what is fluorescence in the first place? So you're shining a light on something and it goes back at you. You know, you, you all done black light posters. Uh, where was it in? Okay, it was just in Monterey. And on the fisherman, or near, in Fisherman's Wharf, there's a, a black light golf, mini golf. You know, so we all see black light things everywhere. So, so what's going on? when you shine light on something. Well, an, an atom, this is a simplistic model of an atom with a nucleus and electrons running around it. It's minding its own business, and the electrons, shown there in red, uh, like to be in the ground state. They like to be as close to the nucleus as they can be. And so what happens when light comes towards that, that uh, molecule that's got that atom? Well, one thing that can happen is it can just pass through. It can be transmitted. This is what happens when light hits windows, for the most part. It just goes through. 
Uh, another thing that can happen is it can be reflected, unchanged. It can, it can interact with the surface and come back with the same color, with the same wavelength. This is why you can see yourself in the mirror. Another thing that can happen is that the energy of the, of the photon of light can be absorbed by an electron and it gets promoted to an excited state, to a higher orbital. Now that's unstable. It does not want to be there. So in a fairly short amount of time, it will come back to the ground state. One way it can do that is just by loss of mechanical energy. And that gets turned into the heat in the atom, in the substance, and this is absorption. This is why this black shirt, which is not fluorescent, is not reflecting a lot of light. All the light that hits it does not come back. Where does it go? It gets absorbed. White clothes, the light is bouncing back. This is why you get hotter in dark clothes than in light clothes, because the light is actually being absorbed by the clothes. So that's one thing is just absorption, and that's happening in corals. That's where the energy for photosynthesis goes. Uh, things that are not fluorescent that have color, this is why they have color, because certain wavelengths are being preferentially absorbed. But another thing that can happen is that when the electron jumps down, it can release a photon of light. But be in between jumping up and jumping down, there's a little bit of energy lost. I've left off another physics-y kind of diagram that shows sub-levels of energy, but a little bit of energy is lost. So the, f the, the energy of the photon coming out is less than the energy of the photon coming in, which means it's at a longer wavelength, means it's at a different color. So this is why you can shine uh, black light things on posters and you get all the colors coming out. This is why you go downstairs and you see blue light shining on corals and what comes out, greens, oranges, reds, all these sorts of things because the wavelengths, the energy is being converted. So just diagrammatically, what you're doing is you're shining an illumination source. I've got it showing blue and white there because I've kind of pirated this <laughs> diagram from something else. And uh, it, it hits a surface, and let's assume it's a fluorescent surface. So what I'm talking about here is what you see when you look at, at, at your aquariums lit up in these ways. And what's coming back is a combination of reflected light of the same wavelength that you've put on and light that's been transformed by fluorescence. And that's going to get to an imaging device, whether it's your eye or a camera. And you're going to see this combination of reflected light and fluorescent light. And that's important, thinking about the combination, because often a lot of light gets reflected and only a little bit gets fluoresced. So if you, if you don't do something about the reflected light, you're not going to see some of the fluorescence. It's just going to be overwhelmed by the, by the uh, reflected light, and the fluorescent part will be hidden. So one thing you can do about that is you can add a barrier filter that takes out the reflected light and transmits the fluorescence. So I had to make up some new terminology. Yeah, well, it's not too, you know, whatever, a way to talk about it. I tend to think of this, this would be what I would call a true or pure fluorescence, where the only thing you're seeing or recording is the fluorescence not mixed with reflected light. So if I want to say, what is the color of the fluorescing pigment? I need to isolate the fluorescence. I can't mix it with a reflected light because I'll get a false color effect. Uh, when you have a combination of the reflected light and the fluorescence, which is what you mostly have in the aquarium tanks, you'll get what I might call fluorescence enhanced. I know you talk about lights that make the fluorescence pop. So you're getting the visual general reflectance plus the, uh, plus the enhancement from fluorescence. So here's, here's an example. Here's, a, a, again, from one of my first trips to Honduras, a coral on the side of a shipwreck, uh, a lot of algae just over, overgrowing the side. There's only one bright thing in that picture, and that's that red sponge in the lower right. And this is now broadband white reflected light, and everything else looks pretty bland. Now if we go to a true fluorescence image, totally transformed. That coral was incredibly fluorescent. You had no idea when you lit it up with a broadband white light. And that sponge is now the only purely black thing in that picture because it had its color by the way it absorbed and reflected light and has no fluorescence. So in a true fluorescence image, anything that does not fluoresce disappears. It goes black. So here's a, uh, some pictures I took a long time ago. They're pretty, pretty bad, but they illustrate. Here's a, here's a friend's tank. Not a very good tank, but anyway, illuminated with, brought with white light. And you can see that that coral on the top is, has got some green fluorescence. You can tell that. And the one on the right has a kind of a little bit of a reddish glow that tells you something's going on there. The rest of it is more bland. 
Uh, now it's, it's blue light, and you can really start to see that uh, top coral. And now we're going to add a yellow barrier filter that's going to get rid of most of the blue and make the fluorescence really pop out. Now that's we're back to what I call true fluorescence, and if we cover the whole tank, it's really transformed. And there are fluorescences that you will not see if you don't do this. So I got, some, uh, I got permission to use some pictures from uh, Daniel Stupin. Do, do, do most of you know who he is? Wow, okay, you should. Uh, and, and what I've done here, by the way, is if you notice on the left, I've put in some, I made some short links to websites where it made sense, and I know that this, uh, this talk is being recorded, so that you can, uh, you can uh, uh, see these afterwards and follow these links, and also if you email me, I'm perfectly happy to make these connections. But he's doing some incredible microscopy photography. He, fo he specializes on super macro microscopy of corals. So this is a great illustration he did of a coral that's illuminated by, by white light. So it really, you know, it's got the brown from the zooxanthellae. Doesn't really look like it's particularly fluorescent. And now what he's, now the next, he's, he's put in lighting that simulates, that, well, it doesn't sound, what, what he does is the kind of lighting you're going to have in a reef tank that's going to be enhancing the fluorescence. So now you can really see that green fluorescence in the middle and you're starting to get the pinkish glow from the rest of it. So that's what I would call the fluorescence enhanced reflected. And then another image of the same thing, pure fluorescence. Totally, you know, there's way more information there if you happen to be obsessed with fluorescence. The other thing you can see is next to the, to the green, I don't know if I have a pointer here, doesn't matter, whoops, next to, next to the green, you can see some red, it's fairly weak. That's, cor that's fluorescence from the chlorophyll in the symbiotic algae. So that is a weak fluorescence, that red glow from chlorophyll is relatively weak, and you're virtually never gonna see that with a fluorescence enhanced reflectance kind of thing. You're generally not gonna look at those tanks downstairs and see that really nice red glow from chlorophyll if you eliminate the, if you go to a true fluorescence view, it becomes easy to see and there's a lot of, so it's a, it's a great way, by the way, of seeing algae growing in your tank because you can, it, it all has uh, red fluorescence and you can see it. Now there are situations in nature where you can see the fluorescence. Here's a photograph that was sent to me by, by a guy named Conrad Blickenstorfer who runs a site called Scuba Diver Info. This is a photograph taken at about 60 feet with ambient light. And, and Conrad was, was uh, astute enough to realize that this should be an impossible photograph because there is no red light at 60 feet. That's all filtered out. Red, a red, if you took a red shirt, if you took your red badge holders down to 60 feet, they would be essentially black because there's no red light to reflect from them. So he knew that that must, he suspected it must be fluorescence. And he also fortunately took a white light flash photograph. So by the way, that red is the most colorful thing there. But if you now take a white light flash photograph, the part that was fluorescing is now eh, it's kind of brown and other things are colorful. So they, were, they lost their color. The stuff uh, below the coral there, which is so bright orange red, was not fluorescent. So in that picture, it's gone really dull. So you can see this, uh, you can see fluorescence underwater if you go deep enough to where the ambient light is removed. Uh, here's a coral that he saw down there and he just said, yeah, well, you know, this orange glow just doesn't, you know, doesn't look natural. And sure enough, if he took a white light flash, certain, now all of a sudden there's other colorful things in that image. But the coral, you know, things that you don't even notice are now striking and colorful and the coral is just kind of brown. So you can see this under ordinary circumstances, but that doesn't mean that every time you flash a white flash that all the fluorescence goes away. Some of the fluorescence is so strong. Here's a photograph of a coral that's, that's, under, uh, that, that's taken with a white light flash, and it is just green, green, green. So sometimes the fluorescence is just so strong that it's just gonna be evident no matter what you do. You cannot make it go away. And you've seen that. I mean, you've seen a lot of corals in your tanks down there are just green all the time no matter what you do and it's these fluorescent pigments are very strong. I happened to be in Monterey just before I came here. I went to the Monterey Aquarium. Here's a couple out of focus uh, uh, anemones of some sort that I just, you know, here it is, a very whitely lit aquarium tank, but it was just clear, you know, you can just look at that and say, okay, that's, 
obviously a fluorescent green middle, and I'm a pretty good guess that those tentacles would be pretty spectacular if I were to light them up with fluorescence. And some pictures I took yesterday. Uh, I, I got here uh, midday yesterday, and I, I spent a little bit of time downstairs taking some photographs. Uh, I, 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 this, this is at the, uh, this Echo Tech has a nice uh, iPad controlled slider where you can really fool around with the color of the light. So I took a photograph, I set it at pretty much a white light uh, setup, and you can see certain corals are popping out there. Uh, then made it a little more blue, and the fluorescence comes out a little bit more, uh, a little bluer, and the fluorescence pops even more. And then I added a yellow barrier filter over my camera, and I got rid of the, the blue, and really left the fluorescence, and now there's way more to see, and there's a coral, um, you see the two greens in the middle, and then just to the right, there's one that's got green in the centers, but you can see the red. That's the chlorophyll fluorescence from the symbiotic algae. You're just not going to see that even in that. There's a hint of it there, but you're not really seeing it. Uh, another tank, this is the tank at, uh, that's next to the reef builders. This is about what it looks like under the lighting that's in there. This is it photographed just adding the yellow filter, doing absolutely nothing else, just adding the yellow filter to cut out blue, so it already brings it out a little bit. Then I have a blue light flash, an electronic flash that just puts out blue light. So I left this exact exposure and fired the flash, and that just popped the fluorescence even more. And then I did the same thing with, a, with an exposure setting that eliminated the ambient light and took a pure fluorescence image. So what I wanted to do was talk about with this part is talk about what you're seeing uh, when you're looking at those tanks downstairs and when you're looking at your tanks and what the influence of fluorescence is on what you're seeing. Now I'm going to talk a little bit about what I know uh, more about, which is, which is uh, fluorescence for diving. We make gear for divers to do uh, night diving for fluorescence. And there's been a lot of advances in technology there. I was talking to someone just a few minutes ago. Uh, Ten years ago at, at the, the dive equipment show, you know, I was the only person with a, with a booth trying to convince people that they should do fluorescence night diving and was not terribly successful at it. And over time, it's grown. I've made an alliance with a company called Light in Motion that's really a high-end underwater lighting manufacturer, and they make a light using our uh, technology and collaboration. So that top left light is just a super cool light for doing, uh, really powerful now for doing underwater fluorescence. They've got another little portable one. The one at the bottom is one that I make. So these are now blue LED lights. You don't want to take a white light and put a filter on it. That's really inefficient because you're just scrounging 10% of the energy. You're throwing away most of it. Make a light with a blue LED. It's going to put all that energy where you want it, and now it becomes really practical. If you want to modify your flash to take instantaneous flash photographs, you can get a filter that just goes over the front of the flash, turns that white light flash into a blue light flash, get instant photographs. So you can just swim around, find something with your blue light, switch over to your photo rig, bam, get a gorgeous picture. You need the yellow barrier filter. Generally, I've always done true fluorescence. I haven't done a lot on anything underwater with, with uh, what I'll call the fluorescence enhanced, these mixture kind of things. So there's a number of options. The thing at the top is a filter visor that you can wear over your mask. So you don't need a special mask. It just slide, you just drop it over your mask so you're looking through it. it does exactly what you saw before with the demonstrations of the barrier filter knock out the blue light, let only the fluorescence through, and then there's various configurations of filters to go on cameras. This is now getting to be a more common sight. You go to Bon Air, there's probably a whole, there's, there are a whole bunch of dive operations offering fluorescence night dives. So you can go out at night and you can go there and, and it's always been my goal that if you fly into Bon Air at night, the, uh, the, 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 dive, the west coast, the, the diving side should just be ringed with blue when you land. Uh, and uh, so, so, so it is catching on, and there's a lot of people doing some nice work. There, even there, there are some choices in the filters you use. This is a, a picture from a guy named Horst Grunz. He's a uh, semi-retired professor in Germany who's taken up fluorescence in a big way. If you go on uh, YouTube and look up his videos, he's got a bunch of really nice uh, fluorescence videos. This is done underwater with a filter that is passing a certain amount of blue light. So it is not a, it's not a pure fluorescence. So you can see how much blue there is there, and the colors of the things that are fluorescing, uh, it's got a little bit of a cyan-y kind of appearance. I, I did a very fake correction. I just went in a Photoshop-type program, and I took out the blue channel. 
I did a white balance, right, by, by saying, by, I just eliminated the blue and got this, which is probably really more like what you would see. Which is better? There's no arguing about taste. The, the, the one you like better is the one that is better, right? So it's all, this is art, you know, it's just visual. What you like is what you like. So you, you can do this as a, as a walk around camera rig. This is what I use for above water. Very simple, camera, yellow filter on it, commercial flash, Canon flash I happen to have with, you can see something stuck on the front of it, that's an excitation filter. I've got that rig here. Anybody wants to see it, we can walk around, take pictures of corals in the tanks. And even though those, no matter how those tanks are lit up, I don't care how they are lit up, the kind of picture I will get is this. This I did walking around the floor at the Connecticut Area Reef Society a bunch of years ago when I went to visit them. And I just walked around to the exhibitors, looking at the frags, taking pictures, and a lot of fun. So you can set your camera, even if there's ambient light, there's a trick to the camera setting so you can make the ambient light go away. So it makes your light easy because it's easy to focus because there's plenty of light to work with. You're not working in the dark. It's a lot easier to work in the light in the dark than it is in the dark. So if you can work in the light but make your pictures look like they were taken in the dark, that's cool. So I can, not only can I show you how to do it, I've got a web page that tells you how to do it. So it's not exactly a secret. Uh, and this, again, I was in Monterey. I, I lucked out that um, low tide corresponded with dawn. Not that, you know, frankly, I'm not a person who considers getting up at dawn ever to be a lucky thing, but it, you know, having darkness and, uh, or just getting a little bit light and, and uh, low tide was a good combination. So this anemone I did not have to get wet for. This is in a little tight, it's in three inches of water. Uh, Elegantissima in, uh, in, uh, uh, at, at Monterey. Beautiful. So I did a little tide pooling. I got out a couple mornings and one evening uh, walking around in the tide pools and getting a bunch of pictures. For underwater, uh, there are people who are spending Boku money on, on rig. You guys spend Boku monies on aquariums. There are people who are you know, easily showing up on, on uh, dive trips with $30,000, $40,000 in camera gear. I don't have that kind of money. This is a simple uh, housing for a, for a Canon G10 camera. It's got this so the uh, um, a light motion light that has both spot and flood, so I can do both stills and video with that. And uh, just with some easy, easy flex arms, and I, I made myself a little tripod so I could get some steady stuff. And see if this runs. Yeah, I'm doing okay on time. I made a little video just to get an idea of what fluorescence night diving is about. take a risk. Oops. That's what I get for messing around. A blue light alone. White light. Blue light.
this is now uh, this is now some 4K video. This is a guy who does spend thirty thousand dollars on his gear. A friend of mine who's just that same nudibranch you saw at the end. This is now. Look at the incredible resolution he's getting on that. And that nudibranch is one of the. I just saw that a year ago, and that's just one of the most beautiful things I've seen. And I lucked out at the end of a dive, just uh, June, I, uh, right at the end of the dive, shallow water, this anemone appears to be, by the way, can these lights come down? Nobody needs to see me. So you can see the anemone just seems to be releasing fireworks of fluorescent spawn. There we go. Oh, I should have done that from the beginning, my apologies. And this is now some other video by, by Jeff Honda. This is speeded up. This is a Wamino. That's a little uh, flatworm. Uh, kind of guy that you guys know about and they have symbiotic algae so they grow they glow red it's another little flatworm Jeff said he never this was done in uh, Indonesia I believe he said he never would have seen this without fluorescence uh, this flatworm he said two of them would fit on a dime he's doing some incredible macro work some cool stuff underwater. You can leave those lights down. All the fluorescent stuff is going to look better with the dark. Lights? You can turn them off. Leave them off. Okay. Well, whatever you can do to dim them, I appreciate. Um, so this is the microscope setup, actually. So what I've done is also I've made up a system for adapting existing stereo microscopes to do fluorescence. And, and, and the, the reason I was in Monterey is I was at a, at a researcher conference. There were people who were using the fluorescence as part of their biotech work. So this is a way to set up their microscopes. I've got this. Um, so because I had that with me, it occurred to me a week ago. I said, hey, you know, Jake, I'm going to have this microscope with me. It'd be fun to look at corals fluorescing. So I've got this microscope set up down in the uh, reef builder's table. And I'm borrowing uh, uh, little bits of corals from uh, various uh, vendors and uh, looking at them under the microscope and having some fun. So I, I invite any of you to come down and take a look. Uh, this is from some previous work. Here's a coral on a, on a settlement plate. This is for research showing the value of fluorescence. It's hard to see that there's anything there, but if you light it up with fluorescence, you can see that green fluorescent coral poking out there. So researchers use these things for uh, looking at baby corals. Here's some nice shots of some coral polyps. Uh, this, is, this is something I shot yesterday on the microscope set up the edge of a coral and uh, beautiful, beautiful patterns, but you're not seeing the, any chlorophyll fluorescence. If I, if I blow out the coral fluorescence, all that red that appears there is the algae that's growing on whatever's surrounding the corals. And if they're just such different brightnesses of fluorescence that you're not going to get one without, you're either going to lose the red or you're going to blow out the other unless you do some other adjustments with the camera. Detail of the mouth. So I was having fun. This is actually the first time I've done uh, coral microscope photography like for this. So one thing I did is here's a, a pure fluorescence shot of a mouth of a coral and the same thing taking the yellow filter off. So now we've got the fluorescence enhanced effect. Which one is better? It's up to you. Uh, edge of a coral, white light, fluorescence enhanced, 
true fluorescence. So you get some real color shifts when you're looking at the mixtures of colors. Sometimes things are hidden, sometimes it's a color shift. And now I want to show some pictures. Again, the guy who's doing some phenomenal detail work is Daniel Stupin in Australia. Just look at the complexity of colors there when you go into this kind of detail and resolution. So that's the part on, on imaging and some of the technology that we're using to see it. So this is what I had said I was going to talk about. What's the function of fluorescence? This is an obvious question uh, to ask. You know, it's just this incredible effect. You, know, you, want, you figure it must mean something. Well, first of all, where's the fluorescence coming from? It's coming from a protein that's uh, called GFP, green fluorescent protein. Uh, originally, uh, it was... Uh, and, and this is, a, this is a, a structural diagram. It actually has this folding where it folds up in what they call a beta can shape, and it's got a portion of the, sequ the, uh, the, the amino acid sequence is the chromophore, the portion that is absorbing and emitting light. And it was um, originally discovered in a jellyfish in the Pacific Northwest, and it turned out to be incredibly important. It took probably 10 or 15 years between the discovery of this fluorescing protein and the realization of its importance. And the importance was that unlike most fluorescing things in nature, this, this protein was fluorescent all by itself. Usually things make proteins from the DNA and then other chemistry happens and then it's fluorescent. With this particular protein, all you had to do was make the protein and you became fluorescent. That protein was fluorescent. So then somebody had the bright idea that, well, what if you isolated the gene sequence for that protein? and you put it into something else, into something else's DNA, you could actually make that other thing fluorescent. And I was talking with somebody right before this talk, and they said they did this as a, lab, as a student lab. They extracted fluorescent protein from something and put it in something else. This is now being done in, in undergraduate. I know of high school labs that are doing this. So it's incredibly powerful. It's an incredible tool in biotech. Uh, these are some zebrafish that are at embryos. They're, they're not naturally fluorescent. They've been genetically engineered to be fluorescent to aid researchers in studying certain things. It's an incredibly important technique. The guys who discovered this GFP and um, turned it and, and realized the value of it got the Nobel Prize in chemistry in 2008 for this. And it's not just that. There's mice have been made to be fluorescent, and it's not just GFP. GFP was originally green fluorescent protein because it was all, the original stuff was green, but they've then discovered other colors, and they've also done uh, mutations. They've actually uh, forced mutations in the protein, changing the amino acids, creating other colors, other brightnesses. So you can also have red mice, should you care for them. And there's now a whole rainbow of colors. So there are proteins you can get out there named... Uh, uh, tangerine, cantaloupe, tomato, they, there's a lot of naming after fruits uh, for, the, for the kind of color. So there's, there's, there's many, many of these things, but they're phenomenally invaluable, uh, valuable in biotech research. Going, coming back to the corals, there's been a lot of work done. Uh, this is a, a paper from 2008, Diversity and Evolution of Coral Fluorescent Proteins, and you can see there this real tree uh, where they've used uh, DNA tech, you know, analysis techniques to trace back how uh, corals are, how these fluorescent proteins are related to each other and looking for common lineages. Uh, you all know as Aquarius that there's a lot of varieties of fluorescent proteins out there. You see it in the, in the corals and all the tanks. So there has been a lot of work on evolution. Uh, and it's also useful for biologists because when something glows, it makes it easy to see. Here's a detail of a reef. This is just a couple square inches. And I'm gonna tell you that, that in this, there is a baby coral. It's a little brown, little dot. Well, there's a lot of dots in this picture. Which one is the coral? Well, I'm going to point at it. Now it's obvious, right? That's a coral. Well, if you go at night and you look at the same thing, ah, now it's obvious. And that's a millimeter scale. So that thing's less than a millimeter. And you can find it easily at night swimming around. So fluorescence, whether it's useful for the corals, is useful for scientists who want to study things about the early life history of corals. Now. Here's a question, though, is, is, that, is, is what is the function of fluorescence in corals? Is that even the right question? Is a good, good, you know, that presupposes that, that, that that's a valid question. And maybe the real question is, what's the function of the proteins that fluoresce? Maybe the proteins are there to do something, 
And the fact that they happen to fluoresce is totally unimportant. You know, it's just a by it's there. It doesn't, it doesn't make the animal survive, it doesn't kill it. So therefore it's evolutionarily neutral, but the protein is good for something else. So the, the counter example I always use is, well, if fluorescence is so good, why are your teeth fluorescent? You know, are we gonna start thinking there must be a function to the fluorescence of your teeth just because you light them up under very special circumstances, unnatural with lighting that's gonna make this fluorescence come out that these things fluoresce. Now we're gonna go doing research on why your teeth fluoresce. Or are we gonna accept that that's probably your teeth do what they're supposed to do for your whole life and they happen to fluoresce. So that could really be the case with, uh, with corals. So it may be the right question is what is the function of the family of GFP-like proteins which happens to include, by the way, both fluorescent and non-fluorescent varieties. Not all of the colors you see in your corals are fluorescent, but even a lot of the ones that are not fluorescent are, if you trace back to the protein, it's a GFP. If by GFP we mean this beta can structure. And if you just change the chromophore, you can create a protein that absorbs light and therefore provides color, but does not fluoresce. So, colorful corals may not be fluorescent. So to me, that's even more common. Oh, they've got proteins with this structure. Maybe there's something about that protein that's valuable. And the fact that it either gives color or not, fluoresces or not, is not what really is the right question. And uh, even saying what is the function presupposes that there's only one. And w what if there are multiple functions? What if it does one thing in one case and one thing in another case, which is quite possible. All corals live in different habitats. They've evolved in different parts of the world. Uh, there's a lot of convergent evolution. You know, so far I've only mentioned these GFP-like things in nadarians, you know, jellyfish, anemones, corals. They've now found GFP in uh, copepods in this thing called amphioxus, which is a little it's a very primitive fish-like thing that lives in the sand, which happens to have some, well, apparently the brightest GFP that's ever been discovered. So they're finding convergent evolution of these proteins in other organisms. So it, it's really wide open of, of what, you know, maybe there's multiple functions. And I've just turned this into headlines. If you were to take a lot of the scientific papers and, and uh, you know, put them as screaming headlines. You know, fluorescence helps photosynthesis. You know, it's gonna take photons that might not have been used and transfer them to the algae. Uh, you know, right on the face of it, that's a bad idea. I don't, have, I don't have time right now to go into it. Anybody wants to talk to me about this, I'm happy to talk further. Um, it's cheap to be colorful. And that, that the cheap part meant there's a study that showed that the protein is very stable. So once you've made it, there's not a lot of energy required to keep it going. So it turns out that these GFP-like proteins can actually be a significant fraction of the protein component of a coral. And maybe you want to be colorful, but then why do corals care about being colorful? Are they attracting things? Are they making things avoid them? Are they camouflage? You know, it's not obvious why they need to be colorful. Um, you know, rather than aiding photosynthesis, there's another line of thinking that they're photoprotective, that they're sort of a sunscreen. Uh, a couple papers, you know, suggesting that they're antioxidants, that they're helping. When, when you do photosynthesis, you get high energy oxygen radicals and these, fo these uh, proteins may help scavenge those away. Uh, fluorescence indicates stress. There's been a paper about that. Larval fluorescence predicts where it will settle, how well it can settle. Uh, blue light regulates host pigments. Now, there's, there's been a bunch of, of uh, papers talking about how uh, the fluorescent pigments do change in response to light. And your response to that as, aquar as, as aquarium keeper should be a collective uh, duh. You know, I was the first aquarium conference I went to, you know, probably 10 years ago. You know, people were sitting there talking about, yeah, when I take my corals and I put them in high light, they color up. You know, people talked about coloring up their corals. You guys were manipulating the corals by putting them in different light. You knew that, that light exposure changed the fluorescent proteins. And Dana Riddle did some nice work with targeted LEDs on, on parts of the corals to make colors happen. So yes. Uh, there is, these proteins certainly are reacting to light in some way. But, you know, sometimes when, when things go into the more popular press, obviously things get exaggerated. This was a headline from ScienceDaily.com. Fluorescent light revealed as gauge of coral health. Mysterious glow of light found to correlate with coral stress prior to bleaching. This is like the Holy Grail. I mean, I knew this was the Holy Grail years ago. It's like if, if, if fluorescence indicated health, Wow, magic bullet, swim around with the light, know whether things are good. You know, but then you dig in and it's one study on one limited number of one species of coral 
You can't generalize that. You can't say that because that coral in that circumstance responded in that way that suddenly every coral in, of all species is an indicator of health. So science publications, when you generalize the results, tend to be over-suggestive. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that paper. I'm just saying you don't want to generalize too much. A nice paper came out. This is very, certain things fell together actually that helped me with this talk. This came out um, just about a week ago on my birthday. Uh, so happy birthday to me of um, this great summary paper on the engine of the reef. And I've given you a link that will go right to the PDF. But it's got a short, sweet section on fluorescent proteins. Really, so just a couple of nice, sweet paragraphs summarizing a lot of the publications that are out there and what the thinking is on the functions of fluorescence. So I recommend, you know, that's, that's a good resource you might want to look at. A trend of thinking... And I, I, I sent some emails ahead of time to a bunch of the people who are really uh, very active in fluorescence uh, research in corals. Just uh, prior to this meeting, yeah, you, know, that, that, you know, the photoadaptive aspect of, of that the proteins are there modulating the internal light environment, making it better overall, seems to be the trend of thinking. But even that you can't generalize because what about, uh, you know, why is there fluorescence in corals that don't have zooxanthellae? That don't, you know, there's no photosynthesis going on. Why do they have them? Because there are. There are azoxanthellic corals that have fluorescent proteins. So they, they can't be worried about photosynthesis. Something else might be going on. What about deep water corals and anemones? I had the good fortune a bunch of years ago to outfit a, work on outfitting a manned submersible to do fluorescence diving. So you can see the, the lights in the front have uh, filters on them. Uh, the uh, camera off to the right has a yellow barrier filter in front of it. So we got to go down thousands of feet in the, off the Bahamas. And, and sure enough, you know, down in the muck, you come across glowing things. You know, upper left is the view from inside the submersible, and then the view from the camera. And then there's this, you know, what do you do as a biologist when you find something in nature? Grab it and kill it, of course. So you bring it up to the surface and extract the fluorescent protein. So, you know, here, this is from about uh, 28, you know, about 3,000 feet underwater. And it's fluorescing like crazy. There's certainly very little light down there and no algae. Here's a, here's a coral that was collected from also, you know, somewhere around 3,000 feet. So it suggests, you know, you know, why? Why would this coral in this very energy limited environment make fluorescent proteins? There's been a paper, uh, I can't read the year, 2000 something. Uh, some coral, you may have seen this sort of thing, any of you who are divers may have, you get these little pink spots surrounding damage areas on corals. And there's been a paper showing that, this, uh, that the coral produces a red fluorescent protein. Uh, again, probably not to fluoresce, but it's part of its immune response. It creates this, this protein that floods that area. Uh, and then there's a detailed shot from the, uh, from the paper of, of this red fluorescence just surrounding that, that area, in this case from a trematode uh, infection. Another paper, relatively recent, uh, patterns of fluorescent Protein expression, you know, scientists, you know, doing the right thing. You want to make observations and generalize. So this group of people looked at lots and lots of corals, created what they called three classifications of, of expression. One was uniform, fluorescence over the entire surface indiscriminately. Highlighted, where the fluorescence is associated with structural features, maybe just the polyp mouth, maybe just skeletal ridges. Uh, so that, so that it's, uh, and in this case, they're not talking about, that red fluorescence is the, is this um, zooxanthellae, chlorophyll fluorescence. I realize I'm running out of time, but I am almost done. Um, so this is what, what they would call highlighted and complementary, where you would have two different fluorescent proteins in different structural parts. So, uh, you know, that, that, that's fine, but now what do you do with a coral like this? where it's got fluorescence at the polyps, which, that, which looks like highlighted, but then you've got these dabs of abstract arc fluorescence that look like, you know, so is this a, a highlighted coral trying to be uniform or the other way? I mean, why is this stuff just splashed on? And what does that mean for function? You know, to me, if you want to be fluorescent, if fluorescence is a good idea, do it, right? You don't just dab sunscreen on when you go to the beach in little isolated spots, you know, you put it everywhere. So if it's doing something, just do it. Don't just do it in little pieces. So this kind of thing, makes me crazy for, you know, what's the function? Two corals right next to each other, same environment. One on the left, you would call that complementary. The one on the right, you would call that highlighted. Why? 
going back to this one, if, 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 uh, if the function of the um, fluorescent pigment is to change the light environment for the zoxanthellae, family, why are they not in the same place? That coral fluorescent pigment cannot change the light for those zoxanthellae. family. They're far away. So what does that mean? Again, going back to Daniel Stupin, looking at this detail and looking at the variety of the expression of these fluorescent proteins at this level of scale, it's just, you know, it's like, what does that mean? What's the suggestion? Why are they doing that? You know, certainly it's definitely under genetic control. Why is it being done in this kind of pattern? So the science is, is ongoing. It's still being learned. I don't think they often, I think the scientists often don't learn enough from observation. You know, the observations of people like you, the people who are just doing this every day as opposed to every once in a while getting funded to go out there. So I think you guys have a lot to contribute, but you know, really in the end for me, I think what sustained me in doing this all these years is it's just beautiful. I mean, I also like making toys. I like mucking around with technology and making toys, but it's just every time I dive and I see things like this, I just, you know, I, I, I feel privileged just as I know you feel, you know, the way you feel about, about what you do with your, with your reefs. So um, with that, thank you very much. As I say, I'm gonna be in the reef builders with, um, the microscope and I'm happy to do photography, talk to anybody and I'll take any questions.